Hello, look, I I need to address it, right? This this thing on my on my lip. Um look, I I don't I d- I don't have nor have I ever had any real grand aspirations for a mustache, but you know, in isolation, you, you get bored and I thought, "All right, well, I'll grow one and if it looks good, then great. If it looks bad and it's funny, even better." So um so that's that. Here we are. It's I bet you can barely even see it, honestly. The more I think about it, the more I I realize this is uh good. This is a good thing happening right now because you know, to 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 make a video where you review your own short films is is maybe a bit wanky. So for me to look faintly ridiculous with this mustache perhaps diffuses things a little bit. We we we're, we're all on the same page. Anyway, look, this period we're living in is is very significant. It's one of those rare seminal world events that feels like a sort of weird bookend, you know? Like when this is over, the conversation will be about pre and post COVID. And in the spirit of bookends and opening and closing chapters of our lives, I thought it it would be it would be maybe a nice idea to take a little stroll down memory lane. I'm going to watch and sort of critique some of the short films I've made over the years. And of course, hopefully I can give you some insight into the process of making these films, making films at the smallest, lowest, most depraved level. Stray Dog, my my first born made in the autumn of 2013 when I was 16 years old and somehow I I still really like it. Stray Dog is the tale of a heartbroken deluded young man who upon discovering a time machine in the form of a lighter selfishly uses it to go and win his girlfriend back. There's a, a, a looseness present in this one, a very playful, whimsical, earnest vibe present that I think is is quite hard to manufacture. I had no expectations going in, you know? I had no preconceived notion of what a Bertie film is and what it should look like. I just wanted to make a short, and so I did. This is the raw, unfiltered creative expression of, of a teenage boy, and you can really feel that. Not in a bad way, it just really wears its heart on its sleeve and is very blunt with its messaging. Me looking at my past self at the end with such clarity and contentment is still one of the most effective and crystallizing moments in in any of my films. When I was 16, it's only downhill from here. Bit of trivia, I was such an amateur that there was never any script. I never wrote a script for this because, you know, up until that point, I was so used to vlogging and considering that this incorporated, a, you know, like cloning, and it was mostly me talking to myself. I thought, well, you know, why bother? I'll just, I'll just write a few random notes because I'm the only one who has to remember them, and it'll be fine. You know, not for a moment did I consider that there'd be a crew of people, probably having no fucking clue what was going on. Did she ever say, "I love you"? <sighs> yeah. No. Probably. She couldn't have been that serious then. She said, love you, just love you, no I. She was a busy girl. To sum this one up, I'd, I'd, I'd stress the importance of channeling your story from somewhere very real and honest, you know? And also, embrace the chaos, it, it collaborate with the universe. If the emotional core is solid and immovable, then to some extent you can kind of find a lot of it as you go. It should be a fluid process. Um, but that being said, do write a script. You really should write a script. Tick Where It Hurts, good title. I've, I've always liked that title. Tick Where It Hurts is about a musician who in the wake of his brother slash creative partner's suicide has a little freak out in his flat and tries to piece together what happened. This is still, I think, my most outwardly dark film, visually and tonally. There's very little levity here, that kind of playful, vibe that's present in a lot of my other stuff is is nowhere to be found 
It's a bit grim. This was the first time I really thought about storytelling through shot composition. He's often sat on one side of the frame. He's partially shrouded in darkness. Most of the time he's injured on one side of his body. It's very textbook and not remotely innovative, but you know, he's, he's lost a part of himself since his brother died. He doesn't feel whole. You get it. But I was proud of that. I, I felt like I'd partially leveled up as a, as a little 17 year old filmmaker. Did not enjoy squirting red stuff into my eye between takes. Didn't enjoy it. Didn't like that bit. This one was a real experiment, you know? Uh, after a few fluffier films, I, I wanted to see if I could push myself and, and go a bit darker and try and tackle some heavier subject matter. And I, I think I did all right. Got the talent and the phone. And you're my brother. And I love you. The moral is very muddled and obviously everything about it could be improved, but I think there's a lot to admire. Rocks That Bleed, The Prodigal Son. Dean came up with the title. Dean Dobbs, dear friend, dearest Dean Dobbs, came up with the title. I, it, it was called Here Comes the Sun until fairly late in the process and I've never given him his, his credit. So Dean, thank you. It's a good title. Rocks That Bleed is the story of two estranged brothers who reunite at the end of the world. As the sun expands, the heat is applied to not only the planet, but their relationship. Ho ho, it's very clever. This film, more than anything, I think demonstrates a great deal of potential. You know, it was a while back, pretty much everything about it could be improved. Why is he wearing a jumper? But the core idea is strong. I, I think the core idea is really strong. A disaster movie where the disaster takes a back seat using the apocalypse to push very real human relationships to the brink. I think it's got legs. I, I think that's a, a really good template. I, I've wanted to adapt this one into a feature for years and tell a handful of different stories taking place during this world ending event. Uh, one day, fingers crossed. Hey, hey, it's the first time I'd worked with Sammy. It, you know, by the end of it, we all felt like we'd, we'd really pushed ourselves and made something good. It, I've, got, I've got a lot of love, a lot of love for Ox the Bleed. <laughs> Blue Sushi was a huge undertaking. There are some great sequences in there, some really wonderful performances, a scene with 500 plus extras, mad. I am so hugely proud of what me, Sammy and the entire team were able to pull off. I mean, I was, I was 18 when we made this. Blue Sushi is about the lead singer of an up and coming band grappling with their gender identity in the public eye. And that's the thing with this one, you know, it's, it's ostensibly about identity. And yet as a film, I'm not really sure if it has any. It's the most linear, straightforward, grounded film I, I think we've done. You know, there's, there's very, very little experimentation in the way we tell the story or the way we get into the characters. I can't speak for Sammy, but I know I was, I was definitely a little bit bewildered by the scale and scope of everything. And, you know, we ran into some issues right before shooting. I was on holiday and we were trying to patch certain things up. Just by the time we got on set, at least for me, there was just a sense that we, we, we just had to get it done. This isn't the kind of story you want to sanitize. And I, I think the argument could be made that to some degree, we kind of did that. When I watch it, I think you can, you can kind of feel us being very cautious regarding the, the subject matter. And I think in the process, end up kind of diluting that experience. And you know, it, it's ultimately not our story to tell. And despite collaborating with a few trans writers, I think, I think we could have done much more in that respect. But look, it was, it was such a thrill to make. That concert scene, is, was one of the best days, is one of the best days of my life. It was such a joy to work with all these people for the first time and I don't, I don't regret it. To be able to effectively put your vision up there on the screen or to even have a vaguely coherent vision in the first place is 
is tough and, and sometimes it, it doesn't quite work out and that's, that's fine. Let It Be, by far my most popular film and, and still one I have a lot of love for. Let It Be is the story of a recently broken up couple confronting their own mortality through Beatles references and a young woman who claims to be the Grim Reaper. After Blue Sushi, I was, I was really eager to get back to that more cozy, homemade, whimsical vibe that was present in some of my earlier stuff. I really latched on to one singular theme with this one and extrapolated everything else from there. Death. Visually, everything's yellowy or off-white, like it's decaying. There's ghoulish fog billowing in and out of, of most scenes. There's, there's some creepy sound design. I, I really wanted this one to, to, to feel quite, quite storybook. It's messy. The, the film is messy, but I, I weirdly think that's somehow one of its strengths. My favourite scene, I think, is uh, when my character and Dodie's are talking in the hall about our relationship while Death is in the other room playing Operation, you know intercutting uh, at specific points when I'm kind of pleading to her emotions, uh, she's extrapolating the heart, when I'm talking about logic, the brain, it's, you know, I think that's, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Jack Howard edited that scene, so uh, thank you, Jack. It's also one of the rare occasions I tried to be funny, like I tried to actively incorporate humour into my films, and um, I, yeah, I think it works. Levity. Levity is is so important and sometimes I forget that. If Stray Dog is the earnest, cobbled together soul of a teenager, then this is that, but for someone approaching their 20s, confronting life and death and change and responsibility and the idea that when something ends, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the end. There was a time not long ago where she'd jump out of the shower and we'd just talk until her hair was dry. And her hair was really long back then. Now. I can't get anything, nothing, from her. Do you know how much that fucking hurts? How could she expect me to adapt this quickly? She's dying. Fucking sorry? Playground centers around a guy who, in an attempt to avoid his brother's funeral, becomes entangled with a group of forest-dwelling children. And it's solid. I like it. The, the kids really, really steal the show. We actually held the auditions at my old school. I went to a theatre school, so there's all sorts of actory kids knocking about. And, and I can't tell you how much of a strange full-circle moment it was to suddenly be on the other end seeing these kids funnel in and out, just, just like I did, wearing the school uniform that I wore. I'd ask them what lesson they had next and we'd have a little reminisce about certain teachers. It, it was wonderful. The shoot itself was fine, if not a little bit stressful. We didn't have a forest location until a few days before and there's all sorts of legal bits and bobs when working with kids. You know, there were a few hitches along the way, but, but when we got down to it, it was, it was a lovely time. The performances and overall story here, I think are nice. Um, my main issue lies in the presentation. The art direction and costumes are absolutely perfect. It's, it's how we chose to shoot everything that kind of leaves me wanting. Kieran, our DP, said after that maybe it should have looked scrappier, messier, and uh, I think I'm inclined to agree with that. We're dealing with wild Lord of the Flies-esque children. The cinematography really could have reflected that better, you know, weirder shot composition, interesting lens choices, more handheld stuff. There, you know, there's a lot of things we could have done. It doesn't look bad, but I think we could have pushed the visual aspect further. I think the ending came together really nicely. That transition from this mad world he'd been immersed in back into the real world he was so desperate to avoid is, is, is so sad and, and so appropriate. Stompo Grompo, oh my brooding little baby. Stomping Grounds is about a young tap dancer who, while moving out of his family home, 
reflects upon his life and all the mistakes he made along the way. With this film, I, I wanted to make something really cerebral. This one visually is one of the strongest. Tracking down those corridors, seeing Bill silhouetted against those windows, the warm and the cold, it looks really polished and refined. It has some of my favorite scenes we've ever managed to pull off, both tap dancing scenes, the confrontation towards the end, not crap. Fun fact, Bill is is uh, not a tap dancer, not, not even remotely. He'd never tap danced once in his life before making this film and all the close-ups of his feet are a body double. And I'm genuinely really proud that we, we pulled that off. I, I, don't, I don't think you notice, I don't think you do. Because it, it could have looked really bad. That could have looked shit. But yeah, shout out to uh, Josh Baker, our tremendous body double and choreographer. You, uh, yeah, you smashed it. I think how it's stitched together could have been improved. You know, in the pursuit of something looser in terms of narrative, you end up leaving so much down to subtext and arguably too much. I think Stomping Grounds could be read as a few solid good scenes from something longer like a series or a drama or something, there is a sense that there's more to these characters and that there's more story going on beneath the surface. But um, unfortunately, we're confined to 20 minutes. Most short films you find at festivals and stuff are, you know, under 10 minutes long and are focused more on a really solid premise than characters and arcs and stuff like that. But um, a lot of my films essentially serve as condensed features because that's ultimately what I want to be doing. And sometimes that works in their favour, and sometimes it doesn't. The jury's out on, on Stompo. I also wish there was more humour. Um, it's, it's a fairly cold, humourless, uh, bleak experience, you know, and, and that doesn't really reflect me as a person. A lot of my films have this this self-awareness about them. And um, yeah, it's just not really not really present in this one. But I like it. I, I, I feel like we elevated in a number of ways here. I remember being on set, looking at the monitor and, you know, really feeling like we'd come a long way from Stray Dog and Tick Where It Hurts in the earlier films. Just just looking at the the image, I was like, that's a, that's a film. This actually, it, these things I've been making since I was 16 are actually starting to properly resemble motion pictures. Who knew? Okay, I, I can't be bothered to do any more. That was, that was some of them. All right, you're welcome. Film really is the joy of my life and I want nothing more than to keep making things in that realm, make them better and longer and, and gooder. Don't expect everything you make to bang because they won't all bang, you know? Your trajectory should sort of look like this. It should be going up. But if you were to zoom in, you'd see a lot of peaks and troughs along the way. That is, that is how you do it. You've got to fuck up and you've got to make mistakes. And, you know, if, if I made a film that I looked at and thought was utterly flawless, then why do I keep going? Why do I make any more? Beyond the response and reception of each film, it's always been so important to me that by virtue of these shorts existing and having been made by me mostly when I was like 16, 17, 18, I hope it demonstrates that you know, you can do it. Even if you're young, you can do it. And I just, yeah, I think you all should and you should try and, um, yeah. Thank you for watching.